Greetings in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to online virtual worship at Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. My name is Paul Evans and I'm blessed to be the pastor of this loving, caring congregation and joining me once again are our keyboardist Sylvia McDonald and our videographer Kathy Marquez. And on behalf of our congregation, three of us are so pleased to be able to present this virtual worship to you and bring it into your homes or into wherever you happen to be visiting or present today. We thank you for being part of our virtual congregation. And as we worship, we're reminded that the Holy Spirit binds us together. Even when we are far apart, the Holy Spirit is not limited by time or by space. But we do want to remind you that we have resumed in-person worship on Sundays at 11 a.m. And we would be so pleased to have you as part of our in-house service of worship anytime. If you wish to rewatch this service or commend it to someone else, be aware that you can find the link on our church's Facebook page or uh, go directly to youtube.com and search for Jefferson Presbyterian Church, Jefferson, Georgia. There you will find this service and a backlog of other services as well. Here in our congregation, we have a tradition of beginning each service of worship with a time of greeting and passing the peace of Christ. And we're continuing that tradition despite the lack here of a physical congregation. So we ask that wherever you are this moment, Please turn to one another and offer the words, the peace of Christ be with you. And as you greet others, they may in turn respond to you by saying, and also with you. So now, as we worship, bound together by the Holy Spirit, may the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. 
family of faith, let us be called to worship with these words. We walk by faith and not by sight. We trust in God and not in might. For in our darkness he is light. We walk by faith and not by sight. Let us pray. Gracious God, great and wonderful are your works. Your steadfast love is everlasting. You've come among us in Christ Jesus to save us. And where there is darkness, you bring light. Where there is sadness, you bring words of hope. Where there is despair, you bring new possibilities. You bring healing for the sick and forgiveness for the sinner. You bring justice for the oppressed, speaking truth instead of lies. Stir us with your spirit, O God, in this time of worship. Awaken our joy and reverence as we offer you our songs and our silence, our prayers and our praises. For you are our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God continually is speaking to each and every one of us, but we often do not hear. But in our prayer of confession, we open the way for our ears and our hearts to hear what God is saying to us. So once again, let us offer a prayer of confession with one voice, one thought before our Lord. Let us pray together. Our God, who knows each and every heart, you call us to walk by faith and not by sight, giving us new vision that goes deeper than outward appearance. Yet how often we remain blind, returning to a human point of view, relying instead on our society's signs of right and wrong, success or failure. We miss your warning signals of internal corruption or moral deficiency and those in whom we put our trust. But forgive us, O oh God. Become our vision as we keep learning to walk by faith. Teach us to observe ourselves and others as you do, with prudence and wisdom as well as with compassion and love, so that your deeper way of seeing might grow within us and among us. Hear us now, O oh God, as we offer our own personal prayer of confession. In the name of Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. 
And so hear and believe the good news as it comes to us from the Apostle Paul who wrote to the church at Ephesus with these words saying, For by grace you have been saved by faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. I declare, therefore, on the authority of Jesus Christ, that you and I, we all are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, let us now go before God's throne of grace that we might find what we need. Let us offer our prayers to our Lord. We gather once again, O oh God, praising you, praising you for your sovereignty and power. You are God who leads us, who makes a way when there is no way. We give you thanks, O Lord, for you're stronger than every foe. We give you thanks for your creative spirit, a spirit always at work making all things new. We give you thanks that there's no place we can go beyond the reach of your love. And so we are bold to lift our voices to you, to admit our need, a need to express our gratitude, and a need to ask for your divine intervention in our lives. We pray this day for your church in this community, in this nation, and around the world, O oh God. We ask your blessing upon your body that we may in turn be a blessing to others. We ask for your guidance, strong and sure, for we're not certain of the way forward. We pray for the gift of discernment and the courage to follow, especially when we feel battered by the trials and tribulations of this world. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and feet ready to follow and hands ready to serve. Take from us any thought that does not glorify you and lead us on your way. We pray this day for the nations of this world and for the leaders who lead them, that they too may have the gifts of discernment and courage. Grant them wisdom to seek the good of all, not only some, and give them compassion and imagination and love. We remember the many nations and peoples of this world, O oh God, who still suffer from COVID, who lack sufficient food, water, and shelter, who live day to day in fear and hopelessness. Show us how we can make a difference in their lives and be bearers of hope to them. We pray this day for those who are ill, in body, mind, or in spirit, May your healing presence surround them and fill them, and may your comfort enfold them. Hear us now, O God, as we lift their names before you in our hearts. Guide the hands and the minds of doctors and nurses and all who care for others, O God, that they may understand and so treat people toward wholeness. You are a God who makes a way when there is no way, who creates paths in the desert and through the storm. You carry our burdens and lift our spirits that we may bravely walk this earthly way. Help us to know your word, to believe your word, so that we are obedient to it. Grow our faith and enable us to step out and move into the future, the future you plan for us, to walk by faith and not by sight. We pray these things and all things in the name of the one who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Jesus the Christ, and the one who teaches us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Family of faith, as we are blessed to be a blessing, God uses what we have to make a difference in the lives of others. We give of ourselves and we also give of our material gifts. So once again, with joyous and generous hearts, let us offer to God a portion of what God has so freely given to us. Let us worship through our giving. us pray. We walk by faith, we live by faith, and we give by faith. God of great gifts, you've given us so much. We ask that you accept these gifts from our hands, for they are our faithful response to your abundant grace in Christ Jesus. Amen.
sermon this morning is entitled, Believing is Seeing. And it's the second in a series of sermons from John's Gospel that talks about the seven signs that Jesus did. The text comes from John 4, verses 43 through 54. And as I typically do, I will weave those words into the sermon. Let us pray. Gracious God, once again, by your great mercy, give us ears to hear, minds that will understand, and hearts that will joyfully and faithfully follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Amen. As I mentioned, John's gospel tells about seven signs that Jesus did. Seven miracles, although John does not call them miracles. He refers to them as signs because he believes that signs are something that point to something else. Last week in the second chapter of John, we found ourselves in the small village of Cana of Galilee. And surprisingly, today we find ourselves there once again. After turning water into wine, the finest of wines at a wedding, John tells us that Jesus has returned to Cana after traveling to Jerusalem to attend the feast of Passover. As you can imagine, when Jesus returns to Cana, he receives a warm welcome. I mean, he's already done a marvelous miracle and word has gotten out, of course, that he was responsible for that. And everybody in that little village was anxious to see what Jesus might do next. That alone was reason to welcome him back. But John goes on to say, when the two days were over, that is two days that Jesus spent in Samaria, he went from that place to Galilee for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in the prophet's own country. And so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him since they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the festival, for they too had gone to the festival. Apparently, Jesus had performed many more signs or miracles there in Jerusalem, and his reputation as a miracle worker had begun to grow. Jesus also tells us that some of these Galileans were present in Jerusalem and they saw Jesus and what he did. But Jesus likely viewed his welcome in Cana with some degree of suspicion. For one thing, he sensed that the people about him were welcoming him because of what he had done, what they had seen happen, not because of his words. They were awed by the miracles and just amazed by the spectacular. But these miracles did not produce faith. John goes on to tell us, Now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. This man was an employee of the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, the very man who had ordered the killing of John the baptizer. Because of this man's position, he would have been both very wealthy and very powerful. He resided in Capernaum, a small seaside village located on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, about 18 miles from Cana. Apparently, this man had gotten word that Jesus had returned to Cana. And apparently he knew that he had been doing mighty deeds in Jerusalem. In a desperate act to save his son, he had left Capernaum presumably one morning very early and made what would have been a strenuous six hour trip to Cana. He likely arrived about the seventh hour. That is, as the Jews call it, about 1 p.m. He probably had no problem at all finding Jesus because Cana was so small, everyone would have known where Jesus was. And when the officer found Jesus, he had a request of him. We don't know the full extent of their conversation, but 
Apparently, according to John, it was brief and to the point. The man simply pleaded with Jesus to return to Capernaum with him and heal his dying son. He said, Sir, come down because my little boy is dying. This man sensed that Jesus was his last hope and that Jesus needed to be physically present in order to heal the boy. You who are parents, you who are mothers and fathers, know that you would do virtually anything to help your children, and especially so when they're sick. For this man walking to Cana was relatively easy, but convincing Jesus to come to Capernaum was not. For Jesus says to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Not unlike the words that Jesus spoke earlier at the wedding to his mother. Jesus' words here come across as rather abrupt and insensitive, especially to a man whose son is at the point of death. Jesus tells him, however, the very thing he will go on to tell others, you will not believe unless you see a miracle. The reason Jesus was seemingly so unmoved by the man's request was that he and the agonizing father had different outcome desires. The father obviously wants his ill son to be made well and live, but Jesus has another intention. He wants the father, the son, and the whole family to be made well spiritually and to receive the spiritual healing of salvation. As John notes, the conversation is short, and Jesus ends it saying, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. Now, interestingly, the man returns home, but not immediately as we might expect. This is not obvious from the text and only becomes evident if we do a little bit of detective work. You see, the man feared that his son was not going to be healed and would then surely die. And if that were so, he would have started out on that six hour trip immediately in hopes of seeing his son at least one more time before he died. Although John does not tell us directly, the father did not start home until the next day. And John goes on to say, as the father was going down, that is to Capernaum, his slaves met him and told him that his child was alive. The servants had set out for Cana to give their master the good news, and they met him somewhere along the way. John further says, so he asked them the hour when he began to recover. And they said to him, yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. The father realized that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. Now, there are two important things for us to learn from this short, interesting, but tender story. The first thing is that Jesus did a long distant miracle. In those days, there were actually other people that went about healing folks. But no one had the ability to heal anyone without being directly in their presence. How did Jesus perform this powerful miracle, long distance? John makes it clear that he simply spoke the word and the boy was healed. This story reminds us of the creation miracle in Genesis. And how did that miracle take place? The writer of Genesis tells us that God simply spoke and all of creation came into being. Now that is true power, sisters and brothers. But in speaking the word of healing to this desperate father, Jesus was indeed speaking with power. But as he did, he was also once again declaring who he was. The second miracle, the second sign, wasn't just a miracle of healing a young man. It was a revelation that the one who was speaking and healing 
was none other than God. The second thing is that the act of faith that the royal official demonstrated was so important. Yes, desperation was what drove him to seek Jesus and go to Cana. But desperation is often the motivation that takes us where we need to go. As I mentioned earlier, the father had left Cana, but not immediately because it was the next day when his servants met him on the road. But the official's faith was such that he trusted Jesus' words and he could wait. He did not need the display of something spectacular. Although he could not see what occurred to his son, he actually believed that his son had been healed. He did not need to see his son in order to believe that he was made well. For most people, seeing is believing. But in the scriptures, believing is seeing. Most of you probably know that I enjoy watching sports on television. And as Karen will tell you, probably too much so. And while I love to see my favorite teams play on TV, there's something I actually enjoy more. It's watching my favorite teams play on video replay. Why do I like that? Because I know how the game is going to end. And if it's a game in which my team is going to lose, well, I just don't watch it and I avoid the agony and the misery. But if it's a game I know my teams are going to win, it's a different story. I can watch calmly and coolly and confidently, enjoying my popcorn and pizza. I know how everything is going to turn out. If my team is behind at halftime or goes into the bottom of the ninth inning losing, I can still sit there and enjoy the sure victory that I know is soon coming. Video replays allow us in some ways to see into the future, so to speak, by letting us see what has already occurred. Watching live sports, of course, is very exciting, at least most of the time, especially when your team wins. Not so much so when your team loses. But that's the way, family of faith, that our lives are lived. Our lives are lived in the present moment by moment, day by day. You know, it's good to envision the future. It's good to reminisce about the past, but it is in the final analysis, the present in which we live. But Jesus' words of healing enable the father to anticipate the future, a future in which his son was alive and well. The father did not need that dramatic miracle, but he did need a sign. And what was the sign? The sign was simply Jesus and his powerful words. All that was necessary was for Jesus to speak and say, your son will live. Sisters and brothers, if you were taking that 18 mile walk back to Capernaum, and you were the father of that child or the mother, what kind of walk would you take? As the Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthian church, we walk by faith and not by sight. Throughout Scripture, God calls on his people to move out in faith, often without any hard evidence of certainty. We don't get to see our lives through the lens of a video replay. We see our lives moment by moment and day to day. But at each and every moment, Jesus is calling you and me to believe and therefore to see, to believe his words and to step out in faith. Laura Copley has written, Jesus wanted the salvation of more than just the official's son. He wanted the salvation of the official himself. He wanted the salvation of the official's family. And to do that, the official had to stake his faith on more than just signs and wonders, 
but on Jesus himself. So Jesus doesn't give the official what he asked for. He gives him something better. He gives him what he needs. Family of faith, that is what Jesus desires for each and every one of us as well. And in these days ahead, let us indeed walk by faith and not by sight. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. family faith as we prepare to go out into God's world. We offer our congregational covenant. And as we say these words, let us especially be tuned to that first line that talks about how we go into the world. And so with one voice, we say together, I go into the world with the faith of Jesus to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love my neighbor as myself, and to do the good works of righteousness. And as we go, remember that God uses what you have to fill a need which you never could have filled. God uses where you are to take you where you never could have gone. God uses what you can do to accomplish what you never could have done. God uses who you are to let you become who you never could have been. And now, may the grace and peace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ who walks with us as we walk by faith and not by sight. May his grace and peace be with you this day and always. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>